If you've studied some quantum mechanics before, you've likely run into one or both of these fundamental equations. The first is called the canonical commutation relation between the position operator x and the momentum operator p. It's one of the defining equations of quantum mechanics, and it's what leads, for example, to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that you can't know the position and momentum of a particle at the same time. The second is called the Heisenberg equation of motion for an operator q. This is what tells us how operators in quantum mechanics change with time. It's equivalent to the Schrodinger equation for states. In both of these equations, the square brackets stand for the commutator, like you might have seen before for matrices. It just means to first act the operators in the forward order and then subtract the reverse order, AB minus BA. H over here stands for the Hamiltonian operator. More on that in a minute. And H bar is Planck's constant, which sets the scale of quantum effects. But if you haven't studied much classical Hamiltonian mechanics before you start on quantum mechanics, then these equations might look particularly out of left field the first time you see them. Not that quantum mechanics isn't most definitely strange in and of itself, just that most of the equations have close parallels in the much less confusing world of classical mechanics. In particular, the commutator of operators in quantum mechanics is closely analogous in classical mechanics to what's called a Poisson bracket. So, in this physics mini lesson, I want to tell you a little bit about Poisson brackets, which will hopefully demystify some of these quantum relations, or will at least make them look a little more natural when you do start in on your study of quantum mechanics. Let's say we have a particle of mass m with coordinate x. Its equation of motion, in other words, the f equals ma equation, is given by m times the second derivative of x with respect to time equals minus the derivative of u with respect to x, where u here is the potential energy function, and the force is given by minus its slope. The Poisson bracket is going to enable us to write this equation in a more suggestive way. Let's first of all write down the total energy of the particle. That's 1 half mv squared, where the velocity is dx by dt, plus u, the potential energy. Actually, it's convenient to write this instead in terms of the momentum, p equals mv. Then the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, can be rewritten as p squared over 2m. And so we get p squared over 2m plus u. This quantity is called the Hamiltonian of the system. And notice that I've written it here as a function of x and p. The xp plane is called the phase space of our system, and specifying a point in the phase space tells us what the particle is doing at any given instant. After all, giving the position and momentum of the particle at a particular time is equivalent to giving its position and velocity, and those are the initial conditions that we need in order to solve the equations of motion and determine the trajectory of the particle as a function of time. The quantities that we might like to measure about the particle are functions on this space of x and p. Let's denote a generic one by q. For example, we might take q equals x to be the position, or maybe the kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, or the total energy, q equals h, or anything else. With all that in mind, I'm now going to write down the definition of the Poisson bracket. It might look like a totally random expression at first, but bear with me. We'll quickly see how useful it is. It's a sort of multiplication that takes two of these functions, q1 and q2, say, and returns another. We'll denote it by these curly braces, and it's given by the derivative of the first thing, q1, with respect to x, times the derivative of the second thing, q2, with respect to p, minus the reverse, derivative of q1 with respect to p, times the derivative of q2 with respect to x. I'm using partial derivatives here because q1 and q2 depend on two variables, x and p, in general. The partial derivative symbol just means that we differentiate with respect to each variable independently. Well, that looks a little odd, so let's quickly get at some specific examples to find out why the heck this thing is useful. Say we let q1 equals p be the momentum, and q2 equals h be the Hamiltonian. Then, their Poisson bracket is given by dp by dx times dh by dp minus dp by dp times dh by dx. Right off the bat, the first term is zero. p and x are independent variables here and so the derivative of p with respect to x vanishes. As for the second term, the derivative of p with respect to itself is of course 1, and as for the derivative of h with respect to x, remember that we define the Hamiltonian as h equals p squared over 2m plus the potential u. And so the x derivative only gets a contribution from the potential term, du by dx. Therefore, the Poisson bracket of p with h is equal to minus the slope of the potential. 
But we can write this more suggestively by remembering that that's just equal to the force on the particle. And by Newton's second law, the force equals the rate of change of the momentum, dp by dt. Therefore, we learn that we can rewrite Newton's second law as the statement that the rate of change of the momentum p is equal to its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian h. That's a cute way of rewriting f equals ma. So maybe we're onto something here. Or maybe it's just a fluke. Let's check another example. What's the Poisson bracket of x with h? We get dx by dx times dh by dp minus dx by dp dh by dx. This time, it's the second term that vanishes because the derivative of x with respect to p is 0. Then in the first term, the derivative of x with respect to itself is 1, and the derivative of h with respect to p comes from the kinetic energy term in the Hamiltonian, p squared over 2m. So we get p divided by m for that derivative. But that's just the velocity of the particle, dx by dt. So we've obtained a similar relation, that the rate of change of x is equal to its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. By the way, if you find yourself a little tangled up by all these derivatives, I strongly encourage you to work through all these equations for yourself with pencil and paper. To help, you can get the notes that I wrote up for this video for free at the link in the description. But okay, this isn't looking like a coincidence anymore. Is there a general relation here that the rate of change of any function q on phase space is given by its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian? Well, let's check. As time goes by, q of x of t and p of t will in general be changing because x and p are changing. And we can get the rate of change of q by applying the chain rule. First, we take the derivative of q with respect to x and then multiply by the rate of change of x. And likewise, we take the derivative of q with respect to p and multiply by the rate of change of p. Then we add them up to get the rate of change of q with respect to time. Well, we've seen all these factors before, and we'd like to write them as derivatives of h. dx by dt is the same as p over m, and we just saw that that's the same as dh by dp. Meanwhile, dp by dt equals minus the slope of the potential, which is the same as minus the derivative of h with respect to x. So we learn that the rate of change of q is dq by dx times dh by dp minus dq by dp dh by dx. But now the right-hand side here is precisely the Poisson bracket of q and h. So we've discovered that this is indeed a very general relationship. The rate of change of a function q with respect to time is given by its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. And this is a beautiful result. Notice, for example, as a special case, that for a quantity that's conserved, dq by dt is equal to zero, and therefore the Poisson bracket of q with h must vanish. We say that conserved quantities Poisson commute with the Hamiltonian, and this is what leads to the Hamiltonian version of Noether's theorem, the connection between symmetries and conservation laws. If you'd like to see me explain more about that in a future video, let me know in the comments. It's a bit more advanced than the Lagrangian version of Noether's theorem, which I covered in a recent video, but it's even more beautiful. Thinking back to where we started a few minutes ago, the thing that's hopefully jumping out at you is that this equation is remarkably similar to the Heisenberg equation of motion for a quantum operator. We're not going to delve too deep into the general rules of quantum mechanics in this video, but the gist is that functions on the classical phase space, like q, turn into operators acting on the quantum wave function. For example, we've got the position operator x hat, the momentum operator p hat, and the Hamiltonian operator h hat, and so on. That's what the hats indicate here. q hat is the quantum operator corresponding to the classical function q. The square brackets, like I mentioned at the top, denote the commutator of two operators, qh minus hq. And the order matters here. These operators are like a generalization of matrices. And when you multiply matrices together, you'll get different answers in general if you combine them in the opposite order. If you've never seen Heisenberg's equation of motion before now, you will when you start studying quantum mechanics. For the moment, I just want you to notice the remarkable parallel to our Poisson bracket equation for the rate of change of the classical function q. The classical and quantum equations appear to be related simply by replacing the curly Poisson bracket with the rectangular commutator bracket divided by i h bar. This relationship is in fact quite general. Let's look at another example. What's the Poisson bracket of q1 equals x and q2 equals p? Well again, plugging it into our definition, we get the bracket of x with p equals dx by dx times dp by dp minus dx by dp dp by dx. The second term is 0, and the first term is 1. 
And so we find that the Poisson bracket of x with p is just 1. Now what happens when we apply our proposed relation and replace this Poisson bracket with the commutator of the position operator and the momentum operator divided by ih bar? We find that it's equal to 1, and if we multiply the ih bar to the right-hand side, we get one of the most fundamental equations in quantum mechanics, the canonical commutation relation between position and momentum. I'm not saying that this equation isn't mysterious anymore, but at least now you hopefully appreciate that it, as well as many other equations in quantum mechanics, are closely parallel to much more straightforward equations in classical mechanics. And with a firm grounding in the classical fundamentals, you'll be in a much stronger position to learn all about the weirdness of the quantum world. Again, I encourage you to go through the equations here once again with pen and paper in hand, using the notes at the link in the description. Please hit the like button while you're down there, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and leave a comment telling me what else you're interested in learning about in future videos. Happy studying, and I'll see you very soon for another physics lesson.